Sure. My name is Janice Hansen. I'm an oncology social worker and I co-chair this task force. My background is in supportive care, supportive uh, counseling and, and the like for cancer patients and their families. And I've been with the, I should say, I've been with the coalition for 20 years. So long time. I did not know that. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm Carlin Calloway. I'm the other task force co-chair and I am a nurse practitioner at the University of Colorado Cancer Center in the survivorship and care clinics. And I just want to give, or we, I should say, want to give a special shout out to Ian and Christy and Becky and Jen and Ariana and everybody who keep us afloat all year. Yes, absolutely. Our, uh, our uh, accolades to them are ongoing for sure. So um, in our efforts, as far as why join the task force, it, we uh, would like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what our goals are. Uh, ultimately, we are a task force that's a collection of individuals impacted by cancer. So we come from all different backgrounds of advocates, professionals, and our goal is to provide quality cancer care. And we do that through learning from each other and providing a valuable collaborative network to perform, uh, or I'm sorry, platform that um, helps us bring all of these comprehensive and diverse perspectives together in terms of informing each other, talking through what um, is most relevant for our work and care delivery right now. And we have multiple disciplines that are represented in our group. I think, I, correct us if we have this right, but I think uh, we have the largest membership perhaps of some of the task force. Where are we, Carla? Are we at a, over 180 at this time? So we have lot, lots of people who are interested in our task force and the topic and the, in the um, subjects that we cover. And our goal is to, of course, have representation from across the state and um, that we talk to people from all levels of the experience or all, um, I don't know, levels isn't the right word exactly, but uh, from all perspectives and experiences related to cancer care delivery, both from professional as well as that uh, perspective from the patient and caregiver point of view in both rural and urban areas. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that, Carlin? I think with interdisciplinary, it's so nice to see um, Nancy with Epic and Vicki mm -hmm. with Sites and Insights and Ali with the American Cancer Society and Lynn and um, all these people who come together to try and help people who have been impacted by cancer. So we really do want to give a shout out to all of those people who do great things for people throughout the year. Absolutely. And certainly it takes all of us to do this work and to keep these issues and concerns at top of mind so that uh, our own individual practices aren't limiting us to what the experience involves. The next slide, please. So the projects that we've been involved in uh, at our meetings have to do with monthly, bi-monthly education and webinars. So we bring in speakers for the first part of our presentation in uh, terms of shared topics that are of interest to survivorship and palliative care. And uh, then we, if we have a really robust topic that deserves more time and attention, we also have invited and coordinated speakers to provide um, longer discussions around the topics, um, such as the End of Life Options Act. And, and uh, we will also do a little bit more with regard to housing insecurity um, as far as information. Uh, some of the other topics and the recordings that we have covered so far are found on our website. And so uh, you can see them there and listen to them there as well. And then we uh, also make an effort to share support group and program information. So we work with the uh, coalition on the website to have that information posted there, in addition to participating in um, 
the newsletters that go out that Christy does such a great job with. So when anything comes out of shared interest, Carlin does a great job in sending emails about those. And then we also post them in the newsletter for the coalition. And then uh, participating in local survivorship events uh, at all of the facilities and programs across the state to the best of our ability. So if we know about it, we try to be involved in it at some level or contribute in some way. And then uh, this year, of course, we've been very active in sharing uh, support and informational resources related to COVID. Is there anything else? I think that? it's important to acknowledge that um, we adhere to the definition of a survivor as anybody who's been diagnosed with cancer and the family members and caregivers who take care of them. So it's a very broad definition and those include people who um, have been diagnosed as recently as today, um, all the way back to 50, 60 years. And then we also use the definition of palliative care as um, care for people with serious illnesses. So people with um, curative disease may benefit from palliative care and palliative care is separate from hospice care but um, hospice care most definitely includes good palliative care. Absolutely. I often think of them as two intertwining circles and depending where the emphasis is at the time, but hospice is part of palliative care versus separate or competing with, so. All right, next slide. And these are the current goals and priorities that we've identified so far. Um, I think one of the things that we recognize is that this is a living document and that as new uh, issues emerge and new challenges emerge that our goals and priorities may shift with them. But a lot of it is around uh, diversity and collaboration in terms of working with other uh, organizations and programs that are also addressing social determinants of care. Uh, obviously, in, in um, the spirit of survivorship and palliative care, Healthcare Decisions Day is really important. So we work with other organizations to uh, ex um, extend those efforts in terms of education and opportunity for people to complete those and understand those documents. Uh, in connecting with other individuals and in support of care programs outside of the Denver area. A lot of the coalition work has often um, been somewhat Denver centric, but we are very, very aware that it's so important for us to really reach out and see what's happening in all parts of our state. So that is definitely a high priority is to make those connections um, more vital and uh, more accessible for everyone. And then uh, as well as the newsletter uh, comment we made earlier is we really want to make sure that the information that we share is not only available to our members within the, the uh, task force, but that we also share it with the coalition and the broad membership overall across Colorado for anyone who's interested in cancer care. And then we attend the Colorado Cancer Caucus meetings with elected uh, officials. They have been very, very informative. And for all of us who really want to be able to impact policy and progress with regard to keeping uh, cancer care issues top of mind uh, with regard to how we address them in the state, this is a wonderful forum for us to be part of. And then um, we also have a focus on collaborating with other task forces as we found in the other presentation that was just before us, that there are a lot of common grounds with, um, with regard to the topics that we want to address. And in our effort to learn from each other, we want to make sure that even within our own coalition task force group that we're doing that. So um, we have a large responsibility and task to contribute to modifying and updating the cancer care plan. And so a lot of that work occurred earlier this year and, um, and it will be ongoing with regard to inspiring and influencing our work uh, collectively, as well as our intentions to move cancer care and, uh, forward with regard to survivorship and palliative care. Anything because else? Because Healthcare Decision Day is in five months, I would like to see us work with the Colorado Cancer Caucus to have the governor of Colorado declare Friday, April 16th, as Healthcare Decision Day and 
you know, I'd like to see what we can do with the coalition to spread the message about such an important topic. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, we can get the word out. Ian, is there a form that you fill out to do that? Do you know from the March stuff? Uh, yes. Um, it is through the governor's, oh man. I can ask Karen. Um, I'll ask Karen. Yeah, Karen, I, I did it, I think I did it last year, the year before, but she she will remember. Okay. It, you fill out a form um, and you hope that they do it. <laughs> well, you inspired us, Ian, so we want to be like you. <laughs> Thanks. There you go. Yeah. Low, low goal, low, uh, low bar. Yeah, I, I think there are um, other organizations we can par partner with too that we could actually create a, a webinar that I think would be very informative with regard to the current status of uh, all these decisions and what they mean, what the documents consist of, um, maybe even having some legal um, representation with regard to guidance about how people can complete them on their own with, uh, without having to need an attorney to do them. And I think making them accessible and understandable is really the goal. So thank you, Sandy, for saying there's a site on their website that you fill out. So we'll definitely take that for um, action. And oh, by the way, if you wanna help us with that, we'd love to have you get involved. <laughs> nice. Yes, I would agree. And uh, that's always the challenge. I think yeah, though we have a large membership, it usually comes down to a core number of people who are um, actively progressing issues forward or involved in some of these pieces. So of course, um, the more people involved, the greater success we have. Oh, have. Sandy just volunteered. Sold. <laughs> All right. We, this is, be, is this being recorded? Do we have a witness? We are a witness. <laughs> okay. Very thank you, Sandy. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, next slide. So we meet at every other month, uh, generally the fourth Tuesday of the month. On, on occasion, we've made some adjustments to that, but um, this will be the Tuesday before uh, Thanksgiving. So hopefully everybody is um, still available to join us. And we are going to be covering the topic of housing and securities with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. So we're very much looking forward to that topic. And then we also talk about whatever other topics people might be interested in. So the uh, meetings are coming up in 2021 for January and March are open with regard to topic suggestions. So if anyone has an interest in uh, presenting or hearing about a certain topic, please let us know and we will do our best to make that happen. And also we can uh, uh, hear, uh, it's wonderful, we have a link here too, to the uh, recordings that we have so far and all of the speakers that we have present have given us permission to record them. So you can see that there. Next slide. And in general, if you would like to contact either Carlin or myself, you can do so through our coalition website, our uh, page, I should say. And uh, we also, if, so when you go to the Colorado Coalition website overall, there is a link to our task force. But if you wanted to speak to us directly through email, you're welcome to contact us through this particular, uh, e what is it, address, email address. Well, having word finding challenges lately on Friday afternoon. And I haven't had any wine, so I can't even attribute it to that. Uh, Carla, is there anything else that we should add that you think would be really worthwhile? I think we're excited about all of the good work that our task force does. And we're excited for all the people who contribute to the care of people and caregivers with cancer. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes. So maybe um, Nancy and Vicki um, and anybody else could very briefly talk about the great organizations that they have um, that you may or may not know about. So Nancy, I'll put you on the spot. Can you give us an eleva elevator speech about Epic Experience? Sure. 
So normally, um, pre-COVID, Epic Experience was founded with outdoor adventure programs for adult cancer survivors. We welcome anybody, doesn't matter when they were diagnosed. So it could be kids, um, but they have to be 18 years old to attend. Um, Post-COVID, unfortunately, um, we are no longer doing any of our in-person camps and we have pivoted in a big way. So I think I've sent some of it to you, Carlin. We, we have a Beyond Cancer series and a lot of virtual programs. So I hope you'll check out our website to see. We're revamping the website, but social media or our website are a great place to find what we have going on. Well, we sincerely appreciate all that you've done for the people of Colorado. Thank you. And the picture that's behind you on your video, is, are you on that uh, little boat? <laughs> no, no, I would be the one taking the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is a lot. That is a bunch of survivors being terrorized going down the river. So they're not thinking about cancer in that moment. And they're all wearing sunscreen. So the sunscreen skin prevention task force is happy with us, right? Yeah, yeah. they absolutely are. Okay, Vicki, time for your okay. elevator speech. Okay. Um, well, we uh, have sites and insights, and what we do is we provide mindful therapeutic art uh, to any cancer patient, survivor, and caregiver free of charge. And we've been doing this since, well, we actually started in 2015 and became a 501c3 in 2016. And uh, we, like Nancy, we, it doesn't matter if you were diagnosed yesterday or 50 years ago, it really doesn't matter. Um, we have several programs uh, besides just the workshops that we do. We do plein air and awareness walks and all of those kinds of things. And of course, because of COVID, most of our programs have gone online which has been actually easy for us because um, uh, prior to COVID, we were already doing online um, workshops and classes for those who were homebound or the caregivers who couldn't leave their, their loved ones. So it was a very easy transition. And as a result of that, we have actually, I just did some numbers uh, a week or so ago, and we have now doubled the amount of people that we have been able to help in 2020 as compared to 2019. And we supply all of the, um, I call them treasure tools, all of the supplies that are needed. And uh, we have myself and other volunteers who will actually deliver those if you can't come, them, come and pick them up at the front porch, but we'll deliver them. Um, it was a really nice ride up to Silverthorne the other day. So you know, it's an excuse to get out of the house as well. Is the program just available to participants in Colorado, Vicki? Well, because of the, the uh, expansion of the online, we've actually had uh, many people out of state. We've uh, every, let's see, we've had California, Illinois. There's about seven different states that now, no, eight states that we are, um, and it's just been word of mouth, mouth that they found out about us and signed up on our online and then we mail the supplies to them. That's wonderful. In fact, I think this would be a great time for you both Nancy and Vicki and uh, Sandy to put your contact information on your website so that if people wanted to visit your program online or sign up for any of the programs, they could do that. Absolutely. Right. The next elevator speech will be given to us by um, Sandy. And before we do that, um, Vicki, thank you for all that you have yeah. done and all that you continue to do. Is your healthcare session on the 21st full? No. Um, in fact, uh, I'm starting a new program starting the 21st for uh, the clinical caregivers. And I'm doing classes for those um, for all of you who are out there on the front lines, uh, the cancer um, clinical caregivers is what I call it. And, uh, and also if there's uh, people out there who are just dealing with the pandemic, I mean, uh, please, uh, because what we're going to be covering are things like compassion, fatigue, burnout, and just stress. 
So, and we'll get the supplies to you. And again, it'll be free. Wonderful. Thank you so much. To answer Paula's question, re goal one, um, social determinants of health, is gender one of them? Yes, gender's one of them. Um, and we look forward to having you involved with helping us make goal, goal one the best possible. So don't worry, Paula, I just wrote down your name too. <laughs> All right, Sandy, take it away. Maybe. Are you on mute? Sandy with um, LifeSpark and Sorry Reiki. About that. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted now? <laughs> there you are. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, hey, just uh, first of all, just a quick uh, shout out to both uh, Nancy and Vicki for the fantastic work you guys are doing. I know what it takes to convert to a to a virtual program, and it, it's it's a it's a big deal <laughs> because we've done it too. Um, so, uh, but LifeSpark offers uh, free Reiki and healing touch to cancer patients. We've been doing this uh, for 15 years, and of course, uh, on March 14th, um, we converted all of our sessions to distant sessions. Um, I at the time I thought, oh my gosh, nobody is going to get this. Nobody's going to understand this. <laughs> um, because I remember uh, not that many years ago uh, when we were doing Reiki and Healing Touch and people were rolling their eyes. Some people still do. <laughs> Hopefully none of you, but maybe some of you do. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but these therapies are pretty, pretty darn effective. And um, we've been using them in hospitals. Uh, we work out of Anschutz Cancer Center. Uh, we uh, work out of uh, Denver Health Medical Center, Memorial Hospital, Elements Massage Studios, um, so we, we've, we've really, um, we've really come a long ways and, uh, but now all of our sessions are done over the internet and they are actually quite effective. Uh, I have been pleased and surprised at how many people have said, yes, I will try it. <laughs> and how many people have really benefited from them. We are serving about 50 people a week. Um, so it's been, it's really been quite a success for us. So we're really pleased about that. And of course, I'm always getting uh, requests. When are we going back to in-person, hands-on? Um, and of course, nobody knows. So, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, people can sign up. Uh, it used to be it was just along the front range because that's where we had locations. Now, because it's distant sessions, really anybody in Colorado can uh, request services. So that's what we do. It's eight weeks, eight weeks of free, uh, free uh, Reiki or Healing Touch. That's awesome. That is so awesome. And are we getting all of their, uh, all of your websites and links on our chat? Is that coming through okay for everyone? Yes, we are. Um, awesome. We even have Ivan Martinez wanting to speak up about Angel Flight. But um, Sandy, thank you very much for all that you do with LifeSpark. Mm -hmm. You bet. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Ivan, dazzle us. Hey everyone, um, let me see if my video is showing. Uh, I don't think it is, but I can continue without it. Um, so just a little bit about Angel Flight West. We are a, a nonprofit uh, organization and what we do is we provide free non-emergency air transportation for patients to get to and from medical treatment. Um, we do that throughout the 12 Western states. So that includes the entire state of Colorado. Um, so we do everything from cancer treatment, um, uh, chemotherapy, clinical trials, anything that's medically related. Uh, in addition to patients, we also fly caregivers uh, and family members um, when a patient is not traveling. We do uh, domestic violence relocations. We fly camps in the summertime. Um, uh, we fly oncology camps, uh, uh, camps for, for kids uh, who are burn survivors, um, a variety of different summertime camps. Um, and we also fly during uh, disaster uh, relief. Currently, uh, with, with COVID-19, we've uh, been flying PPE throughout the state of Colorado in partnered, uh, partnership with uh, the Colorado Hospital Association. So we've, we've done quite a bit of uh, PPE transportation there. Uh, and we continue to fly PPE and essential supplies down to the Four Corners area, uh, to the Navajo Nation and some 
uh, additional um, Native American um, uh, nations there. Um, so we do quite a bit, but uh, specifically for cancer, we, we provide the transportation, air transportation when, when a patient needs to travel long distances. Um, um, and uh, in addition to that, we also have volunteer drivers that, that uh, excuse me, that drive patients from the airport to their uh, medical facility or lodging facility, Ronald McDonald House, wherever they're going, uh, and then back. So we, we essentially provide the door-to-door -door transportation for, for patients. Have you had to make some modifications in terms of using your service at this point? Uh, are you seeing, serving fewer people? I know most of these planes are private, small private planes. Correct. Yeah, it, these are privately uh, owned uh, airplanes. We have seen a drop in our services uh, since COVID nineteen. We actually took we actually stopped our services for two months um, uh, a couple of months back. But since I've resumed and have have noticed a drop in our services, and so uh, we've made some adjustments to adhere to the to the safety uh, recommendations of wearing masks and keeping distance. Uh, when providing our services. Um, but we're trying to get back out there and, and let people know that we're here. Uh, we know that treatment for, for cancer patients continues and that need is still there. Um, and so we're trying to maintain our services and, and uh, continue to serve the patients that need us. Thank you, Ivan. Nancy asked, are any of the local pilots flying service dogs in training for canine companions for independence? Um, you know, we, um, that's something that we can help with. We actually fly dogs for the uh, National Disaster Search Dog Foundation based in California. Um, I don't uh, I'm not familiar with Canine Companions for Independence, but um, it sounds like something that we can help with. We, we are actually, we're actually also in uh, communication with um, guide dogs for the blind. Um, because of COVID, their transportation um, resources for their animals have, have changed and actually have become uh, pretty difficult during these times. And so they reached out to us and uh, we're looking up to partner. And so yeah, if someone from Canine Companions for Independence would like to reach out, uh, um, absolutely. Um, best contact, um, you can email me. I'll message, I'll type in my, um, my email uh, or and our website. So you can find our, our direct, uh, our general email and my, and my own. So I'll put those in the, uh, the chat. That's wonderful. Very good information. I actually connected a patient with your service some years ago, and uh, your pilot was very gracious uh, with her fear of flying. <laughs> oh, it, yeah. <laughs> I think it took her an hour to finally get into the plane. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you offer a great service, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that. yeah, we've, we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing this for 36 years now and oh. have over 85,000 flights, so... Mm -hmm. uh, I understand the the you know first time flyer jitters that some people have. So, <laughs> yeah, I want to add we had um, you guys fly campers. Um, we had a young man specifically yeah. from Cheyenne, and we only do adults, so we partnered up with you for our camps. And yeah, right. he got off the plane in Vail, and all he looked at us and said. I don't need to do camp. That was my epic experience. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. flying for amazing. We're very familiar with epic, epic experience. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Very, very true. We, so. we want to be mindful of the time because it is 329 and I seem to be the official timekeeper in every task force meeting. But I, I just want to give a shout out again to everybody who gave an elevator speech to the countless volunteer hours that Vicki, Nancy, Sandy, Ivan, and all of the fabulous organizations provide to people um, in the state of Colorado. And during these challenging times, we wanna make sure that these organizations receive as much support as possible because all four of these individuals and their pride and joy and the others out there have 
quickly reshuffled and tried to figure out how to, to meet the needs for so very, very many. So Janice, I think one of the huge strengths of our task force is being able to connect, connect with such fabulous people. So Vicki, Nancy, Sandy, Ivan, and all who are out there making ends meet for these people, um, you receive our moment of gratitude today. So thank you. Yes, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Be well and, and thrive beyond surviving. As I echo what Carlin said about the innovation and uh, creativity that just came out of this time, I, I second that you guys are all amazing at adapting very quickly. Um, so we were going to have a break, but now we're just going to, since it's